Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar, where we get to sit down and talk with interesting professional guitar players and related music industry experts. If you love playing guitar, stick around. You're in the right place. Hey, this is Craig Garber. When I'm not interviewing world-class guitar players, I'm busy helping clients with their marketing. In fact, since March of 2000, I've helped over 300 clients in 108 different industries all over the world sell everything from $20 books to $5,000 seminar seats and everything in between. I even authored a marketing book called How to Make Maximum Money with Minimum Customers. And now I'm giving away a free marketing strategy session to business owners who qualify. On this call, we'll discuss what's currently working in your business, specific sales and marketing problems you're struggling with, and I'll identify specific strategies you can use to overcome these problems and increase your cash flow. To find out if you qualify and to book your free marketing strategy session with me, go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash marketing right now. Again, to book your free marketing strategy session with me, go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash marketing right now. Thanks for listening. Now let's get on with the show. Hey, everybody. This is Craig Garber from Everyone Loves Guitar. And uh, I am here with just not only an incredible player, but absolutely the sharpest dressed musician we have ever had on this show. We're here with Kenny Vaughn. <laughs> and this guy is just like, not only does he look rock star, he's just a sharp dressed guy. The hat, the glasses, the jacket, the boots, everything. And Kenny, this is episode number two fifty of the show. I don't know that that has any significance, but I feel like it's supposed to. I can't figure it out. Well, I'd say it does. Two fifty is pretty good number, there, pal. Yeah, I think so. I'm so, glad. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely, man. Thanks for coming on. Uh, I you've got a great bio, and I normally don't read all these things, but it was so freaking interesting that I want to include it. So let me tell you about Kenny. Uh, he got turned on to music by his dad, who had a great jazz record collection and he he grew up in colorado but his parents occasionally traveled to vegas in the late 50s to catch people like louis prima the rat pack guys woody herman the trainers and count basie and kenny would go on, go on all these trips he decided like most guys uh in that era that as soon as he saw the beatles appear on ed sullivan he had to play guitar and his dad and I'm always, this is amazing how this all worked out and we'll talk about this but his dad was friends with jazz guitarist Johnny Smith, who wrote Walk, Don't Run. Um, and they were living in Colorado Springs. Johnny was operating a music store. So um, Johnny would travel to Denver every Saturday night to play jazz at a club called Shaner's. And Kenny's dad would take Kenny to watch him perform. So they, he purchased his first guitar shortly after that, a brand new 1966 Fender Telecaster. He purchased that off of Johnny Smith when he was 12. Do you still have that guitar, by the way? No, that guitar got stolen um, a long, long time ago. Oh, that's horrible. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it, it was an okay guitar. It was pretty good. I um, played better tellies since then. So uh, uh, He soon joined a neighborhood rock band that stayed active for four years, and they, they worked all around the area. And in 68, 69, they opened up for Zephyr, which is, if you didn't know this, uh, Tommy Boland's band, and Kenny and Tommy became pals, and we'll talk about that as well. So uh, Tommy Boland was the first guy Kenny knew of that mixed rock, blues, and jazz. And then at the same time this is all going on, Kenny was really going to see a lot of concerts. And check out, I mean, I've never, this is like the who's who of shows. Grateful Dead shows, many Grateful Dead shows, The Love and Spoonful, The Animals, Cream, Led Zeppelin's first American appearance, Sons of Champlain with the great Terry Haggerty on guitar, Jefferson Airplane, Buck Owens and the Buckaroos, The Doors, Hendrix three times, Vanilla Fudge, Badfinger, Joe Cocker, and the Grease Band, Free. God, what a treat to see um, yeah, man. Paul, Paul Kossoff. Kossoff. God, yeah. what a, what a yeah, he, tragedy. Yeah. Just... He had two Sunburst Les Pauls. And uh, Marshall Stack and the bass player Andy Frazier had at Marshall Stack and a EB, a Gibson EB3. So uh, it was pretty awesome. It's incredible. So, Simon Kirk on drums, you know, and Paul Rogers on vocals. And they opened the show. Doesn't get that any better than who did they open for? Uh, uh, Joe Cocker and the Grease Band, and then ten years after was the headliner. Oh so. my God, that's like. But, uh, but I can't the, even the imagine band, that. The Grease Band was tough. For the um, for ten years after to follow because they were so good and 
it sounded so much better than 10 years after who were a little bit loud and sort of dynamic free you know they just kind of played real loud and fast and mm. but joe cocker was unreal because they were so dynamic you know like songs like delta lady and uh you know then i saw joe again like a year later or less uh with uh, mad dogs and englishmen and that was even better you know that was unreal to see mad dogs and englishmen i, I got they only played like 52 shows and i saw one of them very cool. Yeah, so. I actually have Joe's yeah. guitar player coming on the show in a few weeks. Uh, um, Goodwin, I can't think of his first name. Now I'm embarrassed. Doug Goodwin, maybe. Um, oh, cool, man. Yeah, yeah. But he was with him for about ten years. Oh, um, that's great. Yeah, Joe was good, man. People <laughs> kind of, you know, I mean, those records are just so good. You know, like amazing records. Those, you know, all good with, stuff, with, man. With, yeah, I mean, it's so good. And I apologize, that was Cliff Goodwin. Um, some other concerts that Kenny saw, Howlin' Wolf, Soft Machine, Pink Floyd, Junior Wells and Buddy Guy, Jimmy Smith, Robin Ford, Johnny Winter, The Stones, John Mayall um, with Mick Taylor on guitar. Another guitarist doesn't get any better than that. And later in the early 70s, he saw John McLaughlin, Frank Zappa, Mad Dogs and Englishmen, Procol Harum, The Allman Brothers, King Crimson, loads of Weather Report shows, Billy Preston, ZZ Top, Little Feet, Tony Williams, uh, just incredible. New York Dolls, Sonny Rollins, Waylon Jennings, The Kinks, Clarence Gatemouth Brown, Willie Nelson, and Merle Haggard and The Strangers. So all of this was going on. Kenny kept playing guitar, and in 71, he started taking lessons, eventually hooking up with a teacher who's not a bad player himself named Bill Frizzell. Took about yeah. 10 lessons from Bill. We'll talk about that, too, before uh, Bill moved over to New York. Uh, in the early 70s, Kenny's parents moved to rural Kansas, and he stayed in Denver playing a progressive jazz group, uh, kind of like a loose white funk blues group. And he started supporting himself, playing four to seven nights a week in various local honky talks, playing country music with guys twice his age. He also played in a little party band that turned into a quirky cowpunk band, and they developed a pretty good following in the mid-70s when they started writing their own tunes. And they traveled around Chicago, uh, the Midwest, and New York City. So he had this like dual life playing rock and roll and then working in the Denver honky talk country circuit. He uh, went to Nashville on the invitation to play a three week tour with the California duo, the Sweethearts of the Rodeo, and that turned into a five year gig. He then played with Patty Loveless, Rodney Crowell, Kim Ritchie, Hal Ketchum, and Lucinda Williams. Started working Nashville sessions in the 90s, and he joined Marty Stewart and the Fabulous Superlatives in 2001. And 17 years later, he's still there, which is another. You know, musician dog years, that's like 75 years, right? Yeah, that's um, pretty good. It's very yeah. impressive. Uh, he released his own album in 2012, and he plays trio gigs around town quite a bit. He's currently producing an album for his longtime wife, the great Carmela Ramsey, who, if you haven't heard Carmela, check her out. Very good singer, very good uh, songs. And he's looking to record another album of his own soon. Uh, he's got a lot of backlog material. And just as a side note, let me tell you that everybody in town raves about Kenny's playing when I say in town in Nashville. So when you got guys in Nashville, which is like the uh, music capital of the United States of America, the guitar capital anyway. Um, yeah, that is. Yeah, for sure. So uh, he's just a great player. So if you're not familiar with Kenny playing with Marty Stewart, please check him out. He's just a, a, a extremely talented guy, man. Thank you so much again. I appreciate it. What a great list. Yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> um, you know, you mentioned Tommy Bolin there, in my yeah, opinion. Yeah, man. Oh. One of the greatest guitarists ever to play, you know. He just was, he was a master. He was just so, I mean, I, I, the very first time I ever saw him, it was, a, it was a Zephyr concert at the UMC, uh, the Glenn Miller Ballroom in Boulder, where I saw lots of shows. And I'm trying to think who I went to see that night. I can't remember who they opened for because I saw them open for so many people so many different times, you know, I saw, you know, probably 20 Zephyr shows at least. That's a, You're kidding that's a me. probably pretty good. Yeah. My band opened for them and um, I saw them open for a lot of pe people, you know, the dad, I saw them open for them several times. I saw them open for Jimi Hendrix once. Uh, I saw them open for lots of people and, and, and I saw so many shows that, a lot of that didn't aren't even on that list that I, I can't remember what. I'll never forget the first time I heard him because the, 
the PA system was this is before they made you know had modern PA systems, but they would sort of whoever put on the show had cobbled together sort of a kind of like a PA system, but it was. I remember the, the lead singer was Candy Givens, and uh, her voice was so piercing in that system that every time she sang it, like, she'd hit certain notes and it would, like, hurt your ears. <laughs> on, on, <laughs> I, for Zephyr. Yeah, yeah, I remember yeah. that, you know, I was like, whoa. But um, he always sounded so good, and um, uh, he, at that time, he was using a couple of uh, uh, brand new twin reverbs. They were, like, probably... They were the very first year they made the silver face, probably a 68 transition silver face drip edge uh, twin reverb. And he had two of those and he got the best tone out of those things. You know, I mean, it was just so good. And uh, I'm, I always kind of wondered how he did that, you know, because twin reverbs aren't the best, you know, amps for getting a smooth, silky distortion sound. But he always, he always had to, he always managed to do it. He had a Sam Ash fuzz box that he had, <laughs> one of those a red, a red Sam Ash fuzz tone that he used forever, and that was kind of his secret. I think that was his. And I, I, I have one of those things. I didn't and know he, Sam Ash he, made pedals. Yeah, they did, um, and they they had. I think their fuzz tone was based loosely on the fuzz face circuit, although it was kind of cleaned up a little bit. And w when you step on it, your your volume actually drops just a touch, hmm. and uh, that was one of the drawbacks of the pedal. But if you're playing through two twin reverbs, I guess that's not really a problem. Hmm. But the first time I saw him, he had a um, uh, he was playing a Les Paul with a wraparound uh, bridge. He had a couple of them that, that he you know he'd I've seen never seen him guitars. play a Les Paul. Holy shit! Yeah, yeah, I saw him. He had two of them. Uh, I mean, I know he had one, and then he got rid of that one, and got another one, and um, I can't remember what the first one was for sure. It, I, they were both wraparound tailpiece guitars, and the second one, I don't, I, I, I should go back and investigate that stuff and see what it was he had. It's been so long, but um, and then he had a white Strat later yeah, on. Yeah, that's all that I he played. Him. Yeah, but uh, the but the most of all the shows I you know when I was hanging around him it was strictly just that Les Paul you know. That's interesting. Remember one time, remember one time seeing him play uh, uh, a Les Paul Junior. I remember seeing him play one of those one night, and I don't even know if that was his guitar. He seemed to you know back in those days you could trade guitars pretty cheaply. You know you know the the Les Paul you know craze had hit and those things were kind of like expensive for that time but he managed to usually have one or two of those things around and you know but primarily most of the zephyr stuff was a uh, gibson guitar did you gibson um guitar stuff what was he like and did you pick up anything musically from him oh well i did pick up one thing immediately and that was that you could you know mix jazz and jeff beck uh you know kind of like you know, Les Paul, the guitar player, sort of playing uh, that kind of thing. And he had a really thoughtful way of doing that without sounding overtly jazzy. But he was mixing, you know, simple jazz elements into his blues bending and everything. And he was really good. You know, he just had a really good groove and really good melodic flair and a wonderful touch. And he, you know, he was just a, a good vibrato, good tone, good touch. And um, he he was very Jeff Beckish in that he could he could push the guitar in a lot of different directions in the course of one song, you know. But it it never sounded out of place, and, you know. And he also was an Echoplex guy. He had an Echoplex on a stand that was right next to him, and he would manipulate that with his right hand as he was playing the guitar. He would he was like waist high, and it was like standing right next to him, and so he would just be flipping the the uh, speed control and the and the uh, uh, sustain control in the echoplex a lot and, and he used that as a preamp as well you know so uh, he was really he did some really tricky moves with the echoplex um, with his right hand when he played and he would mix that in it just like sporadically in one song he would just like all of a sudden would, there'd be some space effect that would just come out of nowhere, but then it'd go away just as quickly as it appeared. And he, he was really good at that kind of stuff. 
But uh, basically, he just had the Sam Ash pedal and the Echoplex and, and then the two twins and the, and the Gibson guitars. And that's what he was using. And he was real nice. He was a, he was just kind of a, you know, happy-go-lucky um, guy that played guitar a lot, you know. And he obviously he had listened to a lot of uh, jazz guitar players. I know that uh, I know that he liked Les Paul, and I know that he liked Jeff Beck. And uh, you know, Denver. He was from South Dakota. Yeah. Denver had a lot of good jazz players that were hanging around. And I don't, I don't, never really discussed much of that with him, but I'm sure that he must have heard some of those cats like Dale Bruning and Johnny Smith and, and uh, you know, some of those guys. Um, but, you know, he, he was only around there for by, to, uh, till about 71, and then he split and never really returned. You know, he, he went to uh, L.A., I think, in New York, and kind of just, you know, lived around a lot between those two places as far as i know i don't really know where, where he lived for sure but i think he was kind of uh, on the fly a lot yeah. he played he played in uh the james gang yeah he replaced um joe walsh in the james mm -hmm. james gang then he replaced richie blackmore in deep purple mm -hmm. and um and then he had his solo career and he put out a couple albums and then he uh died rather suspicious drug overdose yeah. death and uh it was uh it was always a there was some people that were uh, i was friends with his drummer bobby berge and bobby was pretty much convinced that uh, he was murdered so yeah, i don't know very young age i know he died at a young age yeah Tragically. i don't really yeah it was a drag because you know i didn't really seem he didn't really seem like a stoner to me uh, although he looked like one, but when you talk to him and watched him play, he seemed like a, just a, a regular guitar nerd, you know? Hmm. But he's really good. Oh, really incredible good. player, man. Yeah. L let me ask you that. You've seen, like, just I cannot believe the volume of concerts you've seen. And, and if you can remember, is there, like, a top three shows that you'd be able to say? And, and what about them? Oh, like most? gosh. Well, well, the Jimi Hendrix shows were always really good. Those are hard to top, you know. He was seemed, the the last Jimi Hendrix show I saw was also the last Noel Redding uh, Jimi Hendrix Experience show. So um, that was the last time I saw him, and uh, that was a really good show. From uh, just watching Jimi Hendrix play the guitar uh, standpoint, he's he sort of uh, at that point he was kind of dropping his uh, showiness and just standing there and playing more, you know. And uh, he he really stretched out and played some cool stuff that night. Long, yeah, I remember they played uh, several long, extended solo sections that night, and it was really good. You know, like wasn't all loud. You know, he, he was uh, he was amazing because he could get he could play really quiet and then really loud and really quiet, but it never was like loud that hurt your ears. It was just it just sounded awesome, whatever it was. You know. He was really, I, I, you know, the way he used those amplifiers and his guitar and his effects was just amazing. I mean, God, what a guy. His rhythm guitar chops were just off the hook, you know. His, uh, you know, that sort of uh, Curtis Mayfield kind of stuff yeah. that he did was just unreal, man. You, you know who was a big influence? Uh, Mayfield and uh, Bobby Womack. I interviewed Reggie Young. And Reggie said... You know that that those guys, Bobby Womack and Curtis, they're very similar. He said Bobby Womack was his biggest influence of all the guitar players he's ever had. And I know this is you didn't mention Bobby, but when you said Curtis, to me they're very similar. Yeah, Bobby Womack's great. You know, interesting, really great. So okay, yeah. H Hendrix. What else? Like, oh boy, gosh, they're also good. Um, well, the Helen Wolf show was. You know, certainly an eye opener. I was fourteen. And I was pr probably ten feet away from Helen Wolf. <laughs> How cool <laughs> is this that your dad was that kind of guy? You know. Well, I, I was going with my friends to that show. That there was a place in Denver in '68 called the Family Dog, and um, it was it was operated by Chet Helms, who had the Family Dog in San Francisco. And right. he opened one in Denver because there were so many hippies in Denver at that point, in Boulder and Denver. 
And he opened it in Denver in this uh, converted warehouse, and it was an all-ages joint. They didn't serve alcohol, so anybody could go. Oh, cool. And my best friend's older sister wa- was going out with the guy who ran the light show. And they had a, like a hippie, cool light show with mm-hmm. you know projectors, and you know it was very uh, a hippie joint. You know, very much a typical '60s hippie kind of place. And um, so um, I would go in the back door and we'd go upstairs to the dressing room, you know, and um, I got to get Jim Morrison and Ray Manzarek a Coke. Um, and I got Eric Clapton a Coke. <laughs> <laughs> what was that like seeing the doors? What were they like in concert? Oh, yeah, they that's... were great. They, well, they were, they were young and they were college guys, you know, they were very preppy and, uh, you know, they were really clean cut preppy kind of dudes and they were jazz guys and they're jazz players you know that's they were like a bossa nova band with an electric guitar you know that's what they were and um you know they obviously listened to a lot of uh jazz records you know the drummer was not a rock drummer he was a jazz drummer yeah and you know played a lot of bossa beats and and didn't hit hard at all and um and and he knew how to play the kit like a jazz player would play a kit you know like a like a like an orchestra kind of player you know he was really got you know really good you know tones out of his drums and everything you know like a like a real drummer and um um you know the the keyboard player was playing the bass with mm-hmm. his left hand on a fender Rhodes uh little bass um thing that that fender Rhodes sold that was like an octave and a half um you know, I think they call it a key bass or something like that. And that's what he used on top of his little Farfisa organ, you know. And so he had that going into one amp that was set up to sound like a bass, and then his organ went into a different amp. Oh, I didn't then, know that. He had two separate. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, they that's used cool. Yeah, they used two separate amps for the for the two instruments, and he just played in both. You know, one with his left hand, one with his right hand, and and then the guitar player was playing his. Uh, that was the that was still early on, so he was still playing his SG Special with the two P nineties, and uh, they were just really good, man. They were really, you know, I liked them. You know, I, 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 a lot of people never really cared for the Doors, but I thought they were just fantastic. God, I really? I thought they were phenomenal, man. Yeah, they were cool, you know. And Jim Morrison was really a good showman. You know, he was he was still kind of baby faced and you know uh, thin at that time, and you know wearing his black leather. Uh, suit with a frilly white um uh you know shirt you know and uh, he was he was pretty restrained for most of the show but then at the end he really you know he went wild and you know it was it was obviously the, the gyrating just, thing yeah, yeah he was really good though it was great we you know you could tell they were still you know working on their stage show and how they were going to do this they were really great they were you know the the guitar player was really good. I liked his long, meandering solos, sort of jazzy, mm. thoughtful sort of stuff, you know, and he did all that stuff. It was really good. I saw him, Robbie Krieger. He was down here. This is the most bizarre thing. Like, I, this is about four years ago. I randomly get an email from, like, some tiny local venue. Oh, Robbie Krieger tickets on sale. I'm like, what? And I'm like, I just figure, oh, I'm sure they're sold out. And I click on it, and they're like, available you know row two <laughs> yeah it was twenty dollars i was like oh my god this is nuts Did you go see him yeah of course i went with my son and i'm sitting in row two watching robbie krieger it was like very surreal because you know this is a guy that i'm a little younger than you so i, I didn't get to attend those kinds of shows mm-hmm. so it was like you know here i am and yeah you know, i was probably i guess late 40s at the time I'm like holy shit mm-hmm. i'm watching robbie krieger and he was just like you described you know very thoughtful deliberate yeah jazzy rock it was just amazing though well you know in his style you know he he reincorporated merle travis style picking yeah on uh, on like uh, you know uh, people are strange when you're a stranger that song you know mm-hmm. like it was like he's playing like travis style kind of you know first position country kind of you know kentucky finger picking shit and then he would uh do like delta kind of slide stuff you know, blues influenced yep. Delta slide in his own kind of uh, jazzy manner. And then he would have the sort of spacey jazz things that he would do as well, you know. Didn't use and, a pick uh, at all. 
Yeah, and he was really great, you know. I just, I really liked his solos. I thought, that, yeah, this is cool. It's like different, you know. This is like before they got into the, I mean, like, you know, that, that tune, uh, what is that tune? Wind L.A. Woman. Silver? Oh, L.A. Woman, yeah. L.A. Woman, man, that's just, that's one wicked track, man, that just takes off. It yeah. takes off when they go into that guitar solo. You yeah. know, it's like, wow. And, you know, it's live. You know, all their records were recorded live. You know, they didn't overdub stuff. And, you know, usually it's a live vocal, and he's usually just in the room with the band singing into a microphone, you know, and that's how they recorded, you know. And and they weren't they weren't one of those overdub bands you know they weren't yeah. uh, they were uh, they played like a jazz group and and i liked that about them that they weren't really like some of the you know studio bands that you know meticulously built a song from the ground up and overdub parts and you know all that stuff they weren't one of those kind of groups at all they were like a real blues band or a real jazz band you know mm. just went in and cut it and done with it you know it was a performance, you know. It was all about the group feel and dynamic and all that stuff. And in that, in that way, they were very old-fashioned. You know, they never really got to be a, a you know, a modern studio kind of band at all. Hey, um, how'd you hook up with Bill Frisell, and, and what were some of the most important things you learned from him? Well, um, I was in my. Um, local music store melody music in inglewood colorado and um this guy was standing over in the or was sitting over in the corner playing one of the guitars that they had for sale a gibson guitar i think and um he was over there playing it and i was like that's so why i walked up to the counter and the guy that ran the place uh gordon close was behind the counter i said gordon who the hell is that he said, oh, that's our new guitar instructor, Bill Frizzell. <laughs> and, um, and I was like, well, I said, I want to take lessons from Bill Frizzell. This guy's really <laughs> something, you know. And I, I don't even think I went up and talked to him. I just had Gordon sign me up right then. And um, so, you know, I started going down there once a week for guitar lessons um, to Melody Music, and Bill was my instructor. We'd go in the back with one of the rooms and, and he was just like he is now, man. He was just like a kind of a spaced out um, guy that, you know, he was very, like, you'd ask him a question and he there'd be a long pause before he tried to answer the question. And, you know, he he was, but he had been studying with Jim Hall. So I, I have a feeling that most of what he was teaching me was kind of what Jim Hall had hmm. um, taught him, you know, probably, um, I'm not sure about that, but I'm guessing that that was the case. And so, you know, basically, I didn't really know a lot about um, advanced music theory. And um, I, I knew that I knew certain things, you know, but I really wanted somebody to open up the fretboard for me. So I understood what I was doing, you know, because hmm. I had been playing, you know, just, you know, you know, rock and roll and blues and stuff. And and I, and I listened to jazz, but I didn't really know, you know, a lot about how to play it. My first instructor when I was a kid was a guy named Dennis Freya. And um, he taught me Johnny Smith's arrangement of Misty. And and so, except for he taught it to me in E when it, when it should have been in E flat. But I, I went ahead and learned it in E, and I, and, and I learned how to play that. And I was like, man, I couldn't solo over this if you paid me, you know. And... Um, and so I had been working on that for a couple of years, and then I, you know, I would try and learn a couple of jazz things, but I really didn't know what was going on, you know. And so when I got to Bill, I said, you know, I want to learn how to, you know, I don't want to really be a jazz guitar player, but I feel like I need to know what's going on with this shit, you know. And uh, so he helped me with all that, you know, showed me how the fretboard worked technically, and you know, show me how to, you know, play any scale in any key and, um, and then how to connect, um, you know, the four note jazz chord system, you know, basically, you know, the, the whole concept of you don't have to play the root, you don't have to play the fifth, but you really got to play the, the, the sevenths or the sixes and the nines and the thirds, you know, that's what's important, you know, those three notes. And so um, he helped me negotiate all that, you know, and all the different ways you can stack the harmonies and, 
you know, how you can play economically and, you know, leave out the unimportant notes and play the important notes and, uh, you know, and then build chord melody things and all that kind of stuff. And he kind of just had, you know, helped me, you know, get on the road to looking at things like that. And, it, and a lot of what he, he taught me, um, it would be years sometimes before it, the light would come on in my head and it's like, oh, yeah, oh, oh, this is easy, man, you know? Well, I was going to ask I, you that. Because I remember I, I met this guy one time um, at a teenage fair in 1968. He was playing guitar, this black guy. And I don't know who it was, but he was just wearing the guitar out. He was just, he. it was like, He's playing a jazz guitar, and he was just absolutely playing way over my head. You know, he sounded like Wes Montgomery, only much more forceful. You know, mm. and and I was like, "Man, how do you do that?" He said, "Oh man, jazz is easy." <laughs> <laughs> he said, "It's the easiest thing in the world, man." You know, all you got to do is you know, and, and he and he said a few things, and I thought that's not easy, you know, and. and but then, like, the older I got, I thought, oh, okay, this isn't really as hard as I thought it was. It's really, okay, I, I'm starting to get the hang of it now, you know. And I'm still kind of like, I, you know, lately I've been working on um, a lot of uh, uh, how to play through, uh, you know, one, six, two, five kind of things and variations on how to so solo over those kind of things. And, uh, and, how you can apply it to all different kinds of chord progressions and uh and on guitar it's the thing that's complicated is you know the way it's tuned you have to learn different fing fingerings for different areas of the neck you know so that's you have to sort of you know I'll, I'll i'll work on playing those things in one area in one key and then i'll work on them in a different area in that key you know and uh it, it's it's very complicated and it hurt your brain a little bit because it's a guitar, but actually what you're doing musically is pretty simple. You know, it's just the fingerings that can kind of get you trip trip you up a little bit. You know, hmm. so I've been working on that kind of stuff in my spare time. You know, and uh, you know, keep plugging away at it. That's my hobby. It's playing that kind of stuff. It's fun. Um, in the seventies. You started playing in honky tonks, and prior to that, you really hadn't played country music. So I was curious, like, did you always like country, but just hadn't played it, or like? Yeah, I always really liked it. I did play it at home. I, you know, I pick out little things, you know, Johnny Cash tunes and mm -hmm. stuff like that. You know, I, I, my best friend across the streets, Dad had uh, uh, Merle Haggard records, Johnny Cash records, and Buck Owens records. And that, okay. those were his three guys, and so I was very hip to, you know, this they, these. You know, Buck Owens and Merle Haggard were relatively new at the time, you know. They were fresh, uh, you know, and Merle was really just, you know, having his first initial big, giant success as a folk country music artist, you know. And uh, and um, his songs were contemporary at that time, you know. And I really liked him a lot, you know. He just, like, he had, something really clicked when I heard him. But before that... When I was, uh, before I ever had a guitar when I was a kid, for some reason or other, Ernest Tubb really got to me. Hmm. I just couldn't believe this guy. I was like, this guy's just flat from outer space. This is the most, uh, I said, this is just unreal. I can't believe this dude, you know. And he had the, you know, Leon Rhodes playing guitar and, and uh, uh, what's his name, um, the steel player, uh, uh, oh, shoot. Uh, P Paul from, Franklin? No, 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 no. This is, uh, no, Paul Franklin was a kid at that time uh, uh what's the guitar the steel player's name um from dc yeah, that guy buddy charlton okay so and buddy charlton was like the coolest cat in the business you know he just looked like he looked like a beatnik only he was wearing cowboy clothes you know but he just looked like he was just so obviously just like above everybody else he was just like the coolest cat in the world and you know those two guys playing those crazy instrumentals like at breakneck bebop speed you know it's playing bop tunes basically you know and then Ernest walks on stage and then they go right back to playing the squarest most simple shit and the Ernest Tubb singing and it's just like man this guy is cool I love those guys it was just the most bizarre band you know and everybody in that band was good you know Jack Green was playing drums and you know 
you think of Jack Green as a square country singer, dude, but really when he played drums for Ernest Tubb, he was hip as all get out, man. He was a good drummer. You know, it's very cool. So you had so you always had a thing for country. So it wasn't a big push for you to be playing in honky tonk. No, I like, loved all that okay. shit. I thought it, I thought it was I was wildly entertained by these people, you know. Mm. And then my um, the, our other guitar player in our band's mom had Hank Williams records, and she used to make us listen to those Hank Williams records. <laughs> and I was and and every, her sons would all complain, "No, mom, don't make us listen to that shit." And she'd sing that shit at the top of her lungs. And, and I was like, man, this is great. I love this. <laughs> and I was like, oh, you can play your Hank Williams records for me anytime. I like that. you know. And she would sing along with them. And, and she's like, this is the kind of stuff you guys should be playing. <laughs> and it was like, all right. I like this. You know, this is cool. You know, it's like, what, you know, what? where is this? How come I never heard of this Hank Williams guy? She said, oh, he's dead. You know, but his records are really good. You know, it's like no kidding, man. This so you really wild. absorbed everything guitar related. Yeah. Well, yeah, 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 I was into it. You know, but to me, Hank Williams sounded like rock and roll. You know, hmm. it didn't. It didn't really sound like anything else I'd heard. It was like this guy's like, who is this dude? Just you know, it was just like, wow, that's that's a different sound. It's it sounds like rock and roll music to me, and it kind of was. You know, it was real bare and spare and and that rhythm guitar was rocking you know it was pretty cool you've been with marty stewart for like 17 years um how did you guys first get together and like how have you grown as a unit well you know he was coming out of his uh um country radio phase you know and he kind of uh, he released a record called the pilgrim which was a good record it was a concept record, and um, it was it did well critically, but fell flat commercially. And the record label dropped him like a hot potato. And um, really, you know, he was kind of done with the country radio game. You know, he had a few he had a few hit records there for a minute in the '90s, early '90s. And um, but you know, he was Marty grew up playing music on stage. He was playing with Lester Flat when he was 13 on the Grand Ole Opry. You know, mm -hmm. and touring all over the bluegrass circuit from till Lester died when he was like 19. And then he um, played with Doc and Merrill Watson for a minute. And, uh, and then Johnny Cash called him and he played in Johnny Cash's band for a number of years. He was married to one of Johnny's daughters, but they, uh, after they got divorced, Johnny w remained his best pal. They lived next door to each other till the day Johnny, Johnny oh, died. Wow. And uh, yeah, they were, you know, <clears throat> they were pals even even when marty went off to do a solo thing he never, he was still unofficially in johnny's band you know hmm. he's still you know but occasionally he dates with him he's still that's a thick yeah. friendship man when you divorce the guy's daughter and you're still friends with him oh yeah, yeah he, was, a, he was they still yeah. would be invited over for all and I'm, and, you know, Johnny would come over for coffee and, and they'd go over there for dinner. And, mm. you know, they're still, you know, he was married to Connie Smith by that time. And, mm. and she's a country music icon. So, you know, um, she was you know readily accepted in the cash residence because she was Connie Smith, you know? Yeah. And, um, she's, you know, in the country music hall of fame, for God's sake, you know, she's one of the, she was the steel player's dream gig, you know. Her her records were like Charlie Pride records. It's vocal and steel duets, you know. And um, that's the way that went. Uh, and, and how'd you guys get together? Um, well, we kind of ran into each other a couple of times. And I think he saw me playing on TV and um, hired me. That's it? Just that simple? Yeah. Wow. And uh, how have you guys? Seventeen years is a very long relationship. How have you guys grown as a unit? Like, like, I don't mean like that cliche. Like, what's been the biggest change, or you know, musically, what's expanded during that time? Or, Does he? hey, um, well, got everything. You know, we've uh, uh, you know talked about music and listened to music. And, you know, he's he's a wealth of country music history, hmm. and uh, you know. You know, we've, you know, expanded our instrumental repertoire, you know, over the years of, you know, we've always played instrumental tunes, and, which is not something that normal, you know, 
famous country artists do these days, you know. Yeah, for sure. Well, you know, that's you know, it's a two guitar, bass, and drums kind of band. So we've had a lot of, you know, we've explored, explored a lot of territory as far as being, uh, you know, uh, you know, playing in a two guitar, bass, and drum band is, you know, it affords you a lot of. Uh, you know, opportunity to play guitar parts, you know, and, and, uh, you know, we've got a lot of guitar solos and lots of guitar textures. We play acoustic, we play electric, we, you know, uh, and, you know, we, you know, you have sort of a group philosophy about what's important and what's not important, what, you know, how you want to present your music and how, you know, what, what do you, what do you want it to convey to people and, uh, you know, aesthetically, you know, we play through little Fender amplifiers and, you know, don't use a lot of, uh, um, you know, modern day pedals and all that stuff, you know, we're pretty just reverb and promo kind of guys, you know, and, uh, you know, using Fender guitars and, and uh, you know, I, even our bass player is in on the whole thing. He's the best guitar player in our band. The he bass player? Just, yeah, Chris Scruggs. He's he's the best guitar player in our band, and he's uh, the best steel player in Nashville. And uh, man, hold on a minute. That's, <laughs> that says a lot with with you and Marty there. That your bass player is the best guitar player in the band. Yeah, yeah. He's uh, he's the best guitar player, and he's all, and he's the best. You know, we have the best steel player in Nashville and playing bass in our band. So you know, we are trying to get some tunes where I switch over to the bass, or Marty switches over to the bass, and get Chris to play a little bit of steel. You know, because he's so damn good. It's insane. He's just crazy, and he's also a really good drummer. I've um, I produced a record not too long ago where I hired him to play drums, and then uh, we this girl um, was good enough at doing her music. Um, she had it rehearsed so well that she would just uh, I put a mic on her acoustic guitar and a mic on her vocal, and she would cut the basic track live, and we'd have him play drums and I play guitar and then he'd go back in and overdub the bass part and I'd overdub it a guitar part and then he'd overdub a steel or whatever you know and we'd move on to the next song and we just cut the record really quickly like that and um, he's he's brilliant you know he's just like the best played the coolest drum parts and the coolest bass parts in the world you know it's like it's kind of like having Paul McCartney <laughs> playing drums and bass in your band you know it's like he plays that sort of songwriter drums you know where it's Every single thing is perfect for the song, you know, like he didn't play anything that wasn't perfect and he didn't sound like a drum machine. He sounded like, you know, it was like a kind of like a Paul McCartney solo album or, uh, you know, that kind of thing, you know, like a real thoughtful melodic bass parts that weren't like normal bass parts and, and uh, cool drum parts that weren't like what you would get if you hired a normal Nashville session player, you know. Very cool. I didn't know about that. Yeah, very much more artistic, you know, and more thoughtful. And so he's a part of our band now. You know, we've known him since I met him when he was four. Um, four. He's much younger. Than, yeah, he was four. His mom was a famous country singer named Gail Davies, and she was uh, the first woman in Nashville that ever produced records. And very so cool. she, yeah, she had number one hits that she actually produced, and she's a real forceful singer she had a lot of uh, uh chart records in the uh late 70s um mid 70s late 70s early 80s with her heyday and um <clears throat> so i was over at our party of her at her house one day and uh, there was this four-year-old kid running around <laughs> i was like gail your your kid's bouncing off the ceiling she's like, oh christopher's a genius yes yes blah, 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 blah. <laughs> <laughs> and it turned out she was right because I started working with him down on Broadway when he was like 16. Uh, we were doing honky tonk gigs sometimes together, and I was like, "Man, this guy's amazing!" You know? and, How old is uh, he now? He's in his mid 30s. Oh wow! And uh, yeah, I've been working with him for about 20 years. But anyway, when our our last bass player quit, um, I went to Chris and I said, "Man, you got to help me find a bass player." that can play electric and upright and sing. And he said, what about me? I said, man, you don't want to play with us. We're too old, man. He said, no, I want to play with you guys. And I said, well, you're going to have to talk to Marty about that. So they worked it out, and he's been with us for three years now, and he's he's amazing. 
That's awesome. I love, I love having him in the band. Man, we got some cool stuff on our new uh, our surf instrumental record. We, he does a couple of steel things that are really great on there. This one, it's like a, a Hawaiian surf kind of thing, like a Hawaiian, I think what's it called, the Waltz of the Waves or something like that. <laughs> and it's great. It sounds like Jerry Bird, you know, the guy that played, uh, I don't know if you know who Jerry Bird is. He was the main steel guitar player in the late 40s in no, Nashville. No, that far He's, back. He played, on the, he played on the Hank Williams sides. Okay. That's him. Uh, Don Helms kind of uh, was uh, Hank's road guy, and Don played on the last little batch of recordings. But the main thrust of most everything was Jerry. Jerry Bird was the number one steel guitar player for a minute there. He was so good. And, and Chris is the number one uh, guy that's able to play like that these days you know he can play he can give the jerry bird perfect and jerry bird always played perfectly you know he's like an amazing musician just like incredibly good but he never really would go to the pedal thing those, those guys the are steps there oh, so um, let me ask you a question in your bio i didn't read this but you had mentioned that your dad was a visual artist it's yeah, of, that's what he did for a living. He uh, was a commercial artist. He was a really good draftsman, but he also did uh, advertising a lot and uh, that kind of stuff. You know, he'd come up with, you know, do, do displays, print ads, uh, whatever. You know, he could do lots of different things. And you said he also served in World War II. Yeah, um, he was in the South Pacific. He was the gunner on a two-man airplane. Holy and, shit. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, that's a badass, man. yeah. Yeah, he's a good dude. How did any of this stuff impact you, and either personally or music, musically in general? Which, in which way? What, what do you mean? I don't know. Like, well, his the fact that he was, you know, he had this, you know, creative talent, and you know, the fact that he served. Did any of those things, you know, what was that? What was their influence on you in your life? Well, or I'm in your sure career? you know a lot of. Well, certainly is uh, is is life as a service man probably is still impacting me because he, he didn't really talk about it very much. He, I think he took a lot of stuff to the grave with him really. Um, but, uh, uh, as far as his, uh, he was very influential as an artist because, you know, I learned about, you know, painters and, and, you know, art history and, uh, you know, go to the museum and all that kind of stuff from him. So that's that was kind of a uh, pretty big thing, you know. I think, and, and you know, he listened to you know good jazz. You know, he listened everything he listened to was cool and yeah. and sort of uh, he was and he told me about you know, I mean, not only would he you know the stuff he listened to, I would learn about, but then he would. You know, he could kind of hit me to where it came from, too. You know, he he was he didn't listen to Louis Armstrong, but he was a fan of Louis Armstrong, and he, and he was able to, you know, teach me how cool Louis Armstrong was, you know, and, and why he was cool, and you know how, you know, I remember him talking about Louis's phrasing and, and Louis's, you know, interpretation skills and all that stuff. And I was like, oh yeah, I remember he. Um, he, at one point, he pointed out to me the, the similarity between Willie Nelson and Louis Armstrong. Really? What was that? Well, the way they um, take liberties with their phrasing when they're doing someone else's tune, you know, and, uh, you know, play with it. And, you know, and then I, years after he told me that, I was reading Miles Davis's book, uh, in his autobiography, and he's going on and on and on about Willie Nelson in the autobiography <laughs> and how cool Willie Nelson's phrasing is. And I was like, Holy, oh, my, my, my dad told me that 15, 20 years ago, you know? And I'm thinking, wow, dad knew what he was talking that about. That was a pretty sharp dude. Miles, Miles Davis is saying it. It's one because Miles Davis doesn't usually, uh, he's not very complimentary. Uh, to, no. <laughs> uh, white, white people in general, you know, but I remember he, he his three favorite, White people were uh, Blossom Deary, who was his favorite jazz vocalist, and I was hip to her, and I was like, "Well, that's cool." And um, and Willie Nelson and John McLaughlin, of course, yeah. was his favorite yeah. all time. He said that was his favorite jazz guitar player, is John McLaughlin. Yeah. I was like, "Well, that's cool." 
because I love John McLaughlin. I used to go see him play when I saw the Mahavishnu Orchestra play several times, you know, and that was wicked ass good. Yeah. yeah. Billy Cobham. That guy's yeah. a like freak of nature, man. No, it's not so good, man. Yeah. You know, they were great, you know, and John McLaughlin was always one of my favorites, you know, and uh, everything he ever did was, I would put up there as, at, at my favorite stuff. It's all, all his stuff, you know, he's, he's great. You know? hmm. Um, you are such a versatile player, and I was curious, is there a particular type of music you like playing? I mean, you're obviously very steeped in country roots, thoroughly. Um, but what do you like playing? Is there anything you like well, playing better than others? Well, I've got a couple of things I'm working on that I like to play, you know, um, that I wouldn't play in this band. But, uh, uh, you know, just guitar instrumental stuff that I think is kind of cool. Where I've got a couple of things that I'm come up with lately that i you know uh, you know that are cool you know i don't know man you know i've played so many different kinds of things but i always feel like i never feel like i'm playing other kinds of music because i always feel like everything i play sounds the same <laughs> really because it's me because it's, it's you playing you know? Yeah, and Interesting. it's like I don't, you know, I don't really see that, that when I play rock and roll or country or jazz that it's. I'm always, I'm always thinking, well, it just doesn't sound like any of those things. It just sounds like me, you know. That's so, really interesting. Yeah, you know, I people people tend to, you know, when I grew up, you would turn on the radio station and you'd, you'd hear. Uh, you know Johnny Cash, then you hear Ramsey Lewis, then right. you hear the Beatles, and then sure. you hear the Supremes, and you hear mm -hmm. Sam Cooke, and you would hear um, James Brown, yeah. all in the same station. Rolling Stones, you know? Earth, Wind, and Fire. Right. Yeah, right, right, right. All in the same damn station. You Correct. Know, you, I mean, literally, James Brown and Johnny Cash were on the same station. Yep. You know, Ring yep. of Fire, and then Papa's got a brand new bag. You know, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> right there, I'm like. You know that's that's the environment that I grew up my formative years as as a listener. You know, mm -hmm. so if you grow up thinking like that, it's hard to put music in a box. And you know, nowadays people are very, you know, you know, you you've got your XM radio and you can you can really get your box down to a very small box. You know? Yes. Well, I can listen to this kind of heavy metal. Or I can listen to this kind of heavy metal. Oh, that's that that's speed metal. Oh, I'm in the I'm in the slow metal. Death metal. You know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's like five different categories of heavy metal. And right. You know, five different categories of country music. There's '90s country. There's new country. There's uh, Western there's swing. Si there's '60s country. There's '50s country. You know, I play in a band with Chris Scruggs and the Stone Fox Five um, in Nashville every Sunday night, and we play country music from 1946 to 1956. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we play. Only those that that one ten year period. It's the post war uh, honky tonk boom. So we play Hank Williams, Lefty Frizzell, Little Jimmy Dickens, Red Foley, Carl Smith. Uh, let, uh, uh, let me see who else is in there. You know that kind of stuff. Um, that's what we do. You know Eddie Arnold. Uh, that 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 hard nosed. Uh, you know. You know, 46 to 56, no drums, you know, period correct instrumentation. We got an arch top play in the sock rhythm snare part, upright bass with a mic on it, you know, mm -hmm. mic on the arch top, mic on the flat top uh, that's playing the rhythm, <coughs> you know, the, the you know, basic folk chord rhythm, you know, where the arch top's playing the jazz chords. And then I play electric guitar and the steel player plays, um, you know, non pedal steel plugged in, you know, we're the only, and then there's a fiddle with a mic on it. So there's only two electric instruments in the band, the electric guitar and the steel guitar, and everything else is acoustic with microphones on it. Where do you play that set at? We play at a place called uh, The Local every Sunday night at 9 o'clock. Wow. If we're in town. You've got to call to make sure we're in town. Yeah, yeah. But it's, it's a really super entertaining show. It's really good. And it's like, it's like a time warp to go see us, you know. Are you and dressed in uh, the period era? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And it's, a, it's really, you know, it's like the – it's very much like a, a nod to that era in every way, you know, from the stage patter to you know the whole thing. It's very, and it's our hobby. It's just a, like our little chess club. Yeah. You know, we do it for fun, but we get a pretty good audience, you know, because 
it's definitely not like anything else you're going to hear ever, anywhere else on earth because there are no other bands that play that kind of no. stuff. And we do, we do uh, a couple of Bob Wills tunes, but we don't go too far down that ro- hole because, you know, that he wasn't really um, part of the Nashville thing. So, you know, we're, it's more of a Nashville kind of thing. But we do a nod to that, to the Wills influence because he would come play the Opry. You know, he was the first guy that had drums on the Grand Ole Opry was Bob Wills. <clears throat> Let me ask you this, Kenny. You've been doing this now 50 years, pretty much. Yeah. yeah. If you could go back or if you had to go back and give advice to your younger self, the younger Kenny Vaughn, what advice do you think you would have liked to give yourself? Well, I probably would have learned to play more jazz earlier just to you know, open up my knowledge of the fretboard a little bit more. That would be the one thing I would, you know, I wor- worked harder on that whole thing. Although I did work on it, I just, you know, wasn't really, you know, I, I probably would have worked a little, you know, worked on that more. But I'm still working on it. So. What about anything like the non-technical aspect of it, just like either the business or just the, uh, um, you know, the, the any obstacles that you had to overcome or that you thought you had to overcome but that really weren't obstacles? Well, I probably would have... Go go to school, learn to be a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> I would have gotten into publishing. <laughs> yeah, made yeah. money instead of playing guitar. Um, let's talk gear for a few minutes. What is your go-to guitar right now? I don't have such a thing. Um, I like... Um, your top three. I, you know, I, I'm just a Fender and Gibson kind of guy, you know? Um I've, I've owned lots of uh, off brands over the years. Tisco Del Rey, I like those things, those pickups. And I like uh, uh, Harmony guitars a oh, lot. I love Harmonies. The old, I've got a nice bunch of old Harmonies, you know, like late 50s, early 60s. Mm. Those, the ones uh, that I like. What do they call those pickups? Gold foils um, yeah. and D'Armonds. D'Armonds, or, yeah, yeah, they're D-Armans great. Or, or, yeah. Oh, I have you know- a... Uh, I have a copy of uh, Harmony Stratotone that uh, a guy out in L.A. builds. His name's Dan Dunham. And I'm a big Junior Watson fan, and I saw yep. you know, J- Junior Watson playing a Harmony Stratotone. Then I noticed he added a pickup to it and some other controls. And then, uh, you know, I, and then I saw a picture of him, and I was like, wait a minute, that's not a Stratotone. It just looks like one, yeah. you know? And I, I realized that he kept... Uh, you know, it kept evolving, and I finally found out it was made by a guy named Dan Dunham. And so I bought one of those Stratotone How is Junior it? Watson models. It's great, man. It has two D Armin pickups on it, and uh, it tunes up better. It uh, uh, it, uh, it has a truss rod, unlike the the real Stratotone, but it still has the poplar body um, going through the, you know. Uh, poplar body with the neck through. Okay, so you got your so so. Which fenders in particular are your are your you know the top? So what are your top three guitars? Well, in the studio, for? I I always use uh, one of my Princeton. So I have several Princeton reverbs, and I I normally take one of those to the studio, and I also take my sixty five Vox Cambridge reverb, which was made <coughs> made in America, hand wired. Uh, tube amp it's kind of like a cross between a princeton reverb and a vox ac15 it has really good reverb and really good tremolo hmm. and it was made at the thomas organ factory which uh the the building they were in later became uh, sound city studio oh studio. cool yeah, same that's the same space that's where thomas organ assembled vox amplifiers for a small amount of time they made it they cut a deal sometime in 64 with vox to make uh to license the name and make American-made box amps, and because uh, they were having trouble getting enough of them over, importing enough of them over because the Beatles were so big, yeah. And uh, so they started making um, amps, and they made this for one year. They made the Box Cambridge Reverb, and it was hand-wired tube amp. And then it switched uh, in '66. I think they switched it to a solid-state circuit. <laughs> but the uh, the one I have is. The Holy Grail, man, that thing is, yeah. it sounds so good, man. It's like every time you play that amplifier, the engineer is always like, man, what is that amp? That sounds perfect. What is that? That's a 15 yeah. watt amp. Probably, yeah. yeah. It's right around there, 12, 15, some, somewhere in there. 
Wow. It's two uh, EL84s and, you know, uh, has a really nice reverb circuit and a really nice tremolo. It's kind of American uh, tremolo as opposed to the box tremolo. It's more more like a more like a Fender tremolo. Man, I have this old PV amp. Not old, uh-huh. it's like from 2000, maybe 2001, mm-hmm. um, which John Presti has sold me, actually. And uh, it's got the same thing, reverb, great reverb, great tremolo, and it's got a dirty channel. I love the thing, man. Yeah, it's, those are good. It's just phenomenal. Um, any cool or interesting stories behind how you got any of your guitars or amps? Oh, gosh, I don't know, man. Um. I no mean, trade with Tommy Bolin or something like that? <laughs> no, no. I don't have any. I can't think of anything. I mean, you know, I have a, I have a lot of, most of my guitars have some kind of story, but nothing really earth shattering. Hmm. I have well, a, I have a, a, a Guild uh, X-175 Manhattan that was um, with a, a serial number dates up to 1961. And I happen to know every owner of that guitar, including the guy that got it for uh, uh, his birthday when he was a kid. That's pretty random. So, yeah, it is random. I know, I think it's uh, one, two, three, four, four other owners before me. That's really kind of cool, you yeah. know, especially if they're it all cool a, dudes or good players. Yeah, or, it was a Denver area guitar, and uh, I traced it to. I know every single guy that's owned it. Well, you know that'll help you. If you ever sell that thing, that'll help you too. Yeah, one one of them is a, a noted guitar player in the Bay Area named Jinx Jones. He was a Denver guitar player. Jinx Jones is a rockabilly and jazz guitar player out in the Bay Area. He's still working today. He's very cool. Very cool. Check man. out his stuff. He's cool. I love that name. <laughs> He's Jinx, an old friend of mine. Jinx Jones. Jinx Jones, yeah. Um. You ever sell a guitar you wish you can get back? Lots of them. <laughs> yeah. yeah, most of them. <laughs> most of them. Yeah, I've had to sell stuff over the years to pay the bills, you know, so. Oh, sure, man. Yeah, that's, that's the one drawback of being a guitar player and nothing else for a living is that it's not the most financially solvent way to make a living, you know. Yeah, that being said, you've done it for 50 years. That's a big Big, res- yeah. you know, congratulations and like. Yeah, my oldest, my oldest daughter uh, graduated from NYU on the dean's list. So hey, there, something's working, right? That's some kind of success. Hell yeah! Um, any players who influence you, Kenny? That people would be surprised to hear. I mean, I know you've got hundreds of influences. Well, um, I got one really good story. I got to tell you. Yeah. Uh, I was uh, in the seventies. I had uh, access to. Uh, a, a, a good deal. My my best friend, two of my friends, <coughs> worked at the record center in downtown Denver. I mean, the record center was a very influential place because they had every kind of record there: classical music, jazz, all the all the latest stuff. And they would give me records sometimes, cutouts. Uh, like I got the the first Big Star album by it was a cutout. And, and and they were like, "Hey, man, the little you might punch like thing this. in the corner, right?" Yeah, yeah. And, and you, it was a promo copy, and and that that record went nowhere. Of course, it influenced everybody in the '90s, but you know, it floundered for quite a few years in obscurity until Big Star was, you know, discovered. You know, later on in the '80s by the indie rockers. And now, you know, they're one of the most influential bands in indie rock history. Mm-hmm. But at the time, nobody had ever heard of them. I just accidentally got a big star record, you know? They, I walked in one day and they said, hey, Kenny, you might like this piece of junk. It, it sounds like all that <laughs> shit you like. It sounds like Badfinger and all that crap, crap you like, you know? And they knew I was a Badfinger fan. So yeah. I, put on, I took it home and listened to it. It didn't sound like Badfinger to me. But no, not at all. But anyway, uh, so I was listening to all kinds of music. Uh, because I could go in there and listen to anything. They had turntables, you know, in the listening booths. It was an old store, you know. Mm. And you could go in there and, and you go up to the desk and have them play something on the big stereo or you can go and listen to headphones. <laughs> and um, I got into 20th century classical music, like William Schumann and uh, uh, Aaron Copland and Igor Stravinsky and uh, Dmitry Shostakovich and Elliot Carter that kind of shit. Hmm. And um, 
I really, I really, that, that stuff really, I thought that was very great, you know, all that stuff. And um, I got into Glenn Gould uh, uh, recordings of his interpretation of uh, sonatas and all that kind of stuff, you know, that he was famous for, you know. And uh, then I also got into uh, flamenco guitar. Very cool. And uh, uh, I knew this guy. There was a, in, in Denver, there was a flamenco guitar player from Spain. His name was Rene Heredia. Rene Heredia was working the flamenco circuit. It was a worldwide circuit. And he was like always dressed like a million bucks, you know, like expensive haircut and the coolest outfits you ever saw. You know, he looked like a guy, he looked like a, a porn star, you know. <laughs> a 70s porn star, you know, with the, the cool clothes and just like always had lots of girls. And he was a badass flamenco guitar player. And there was this guy who was a dilettante rich kid. And um, his his name is Laurie. And um, he, was, he was heir to the big, um, a, a, a massive fortune. And so he didn't have to do anything. So he was kind of like the Andy Warhol of Denver, you know, he would have <laughs> parties and he was a flamenco nut, right? Uh-huh. And um, I knew this guy and uh, he was like this filthy rich, lived in a beautiful old mansion in, in the Cherry Creek district of downtown Denver, which was where all the rich people lived. Wonderful neighborhood, with beautiful, you know, lovely old mansions. And uh, he had a, a beautiful one and he would have flamenco shows, house concerts, you know, and... Um, yeah, anyway, I was sitting at home one morning, probably about noon, you know, I'd just woken up and the phone rang. It was Laurie Phipps on the phone. And he was like, hey, Kenny, it's Laurie. I was like, hey, man, what are you doing? Call me, you know. And he says, man, can you get me some weed? And I was like, I don't have any <laughs> weed, man. He said, well, he said, well, Paco de Lucia is over here and uh, and he's he wants some weed and you got to get me some weed, man. And I was like, Paco de Lucia <laughs> is it your house and I and he said yeah we're gonna have a, a concert over here but you know Paco's gotta have his weed you know I said let me see what I can do so I made a bunch of calls you know I didn't have any money I didn't know what to do but I finally scored some you know and uh, so I showed up there in the probably about two in the afternoon and I you know, walk in and Lori's like oh thank god you're here you know did you bring some weed and I said yeah I got some weed and uh and he, so he sends me back to the kitchen. He opens the door to the kitchen, lets me in, you know, it's like this old, fabulous, you know, like an old old mansion kitchen, you know, like not modern day kitchen, but, you know, like kind of a country, you know, French kitchen kind of thing, you know. And it's a big, t- giant round table. And Paco's sitting there looking like 10 million bucks, man. <laughs> he looks so cool. He had, you know, like expensive clothes, expensive boots. You know, fabulous haircut, you know, just like, wow, look at this guy, you know, look like, you know, like something out of a movie. And and he stands up and he shakes my hand and he said, and I pull out a bag of weed. He's, oh, thank you so much. You know, he's like he speaks broken English and he says, Lori tells me you play guitar. And I was like, oh, I play a little guitar. He says, I said, have you seen Jimi Hendrix? <laughs> I saw him three times. He says, Jimi Hendrix is my favorite guitar player. And so he said, sit down. You know, so he starts rolling a joint. He starts smoking. And he's got his guitar there. And he starts playing guitar, you know, <laughs> and talking to me. He played guitar for like an hour and talked to me. There was nobody else in the kitchen but me and Paco de Lucia, right? Holy and, crap. Uh, right? And so, you know, I'm watching Paco play guitar. And he's just blistering that thing, you know. He's just like, I don't know if you ever saw him play, but... No, but I've heard him play. Well, yeah, it's kind of ridiculous, you know. He can, not only can he burn down on the, the flamenco stuff, but, you know, he can turn around and play jazz, too, you know. It's like really crazy, you know. <laughs> and I'm just sitting there going, wow. And so we, uh, so then Rene comes, or Laurie comes back and says, oh, so Rene, I, I, I mean, I so said, Paco, you know, you, you ready to go out and play, you know? And he's like, yeah, I'll be ready in a while, you know. I'm, yeah, and so we, we hung around for a while longer, and I think they brought us some food, and we ate a little food, and, and um, I watched Paco warming up and just playing his ass off, and then we go back in, and, and it's a house concert, and it's mostly just the Spanish people. There was, like, there was a, a really good singer that lived in town. He's a Spanish guy, and then they had a couple of dancers, flamingo dancer chicks, you know, and Rene Heredia was there. 
<laughs> and they uh, so it was Paco and Renee jamming, and then the the dancers, and then the guys that sit at the table, ba- uh, club, you know, they tap in on the wooden table, yeah, with their fingers doing those, all the rhythms, you yeah. know, and with the singer, and then he would, the singer would get up and sing all that crazy flamenco singing stuff, you know, and this guy was really good. I mean, he was doing all those scales, you know, those Mediterranean, you know, <laughs> and they all, and everybody's like, ah, yeah, man, you know, it was like wild. And there was these beautiful girls like sitting there, you know, waiting for Paco, you know, like these young Spanish chicks, you know, with their dress, everybody's wearing like the most cool outfits, you know, like the, the flamingo dancers are wearing those beautiful black dresses, you know, and they're just badasses, you know. They're just like super heavy attitude, you know. And it's like, wow, I'm like, what am I doing here? I'm this hippie <laughs> punk rocker, you know. Yeah, I was like, wondering, was that like surreal, this whole thing, of course? Yeah, it was totally surreal. Yeah. It's like, this is the best thing that ever happened to me, you know. But that was, uh, I don't know, that, that's, that's one kind of, you know, funny story from my past. You know, uh, right? yeah, that's pretty. Hang out with those kind of people, you know, and just be inside of that world in that bubble. You know, there wasn't fifty people there. You know, at the house concert, probably forty, maybe fifty. That's so cool. Yeah, what, yeah what man, it's like wow. I bought yeah. weed for Paco de Lucia. <laughs> yeah, and I've never seen that many pretty girls in one place in my life. You know. Oh, I don't think that's and, true. And You're a musician, pretty, like. Those sort of dignified, badass Spanish chicks, you know. It was a whole different thing, you know. M- musically, man, this is. I'm not interested in, in their answers to this. Top three Desert Island discs, only for today, not forever, you know, just like knee jerk reaction, you know, no particular order, mm, knowing you could man. change tomorrow. Oh, I don't know, man. Uh,. I put Electric Ladyland because it's a double disc. Yeah, that's a great one. Uh, I don't know, man. I bought that it's album down fair. in the village when it came out. Well, not when it came out, but I remember when I was a kid. Great uh, I had it. I had it the day it came out. The gatefold with the the yeah. naked women there. Yeah, I had it the day it came out. In that's fact, a- we we actually bought the first one we bought was uh, uh, at the folklore center. Denver Folklore Center was a big place for me. Um, because they had imports, and they also had blues records from Chicago. Oh. It's the only place in town where you could buy blues records. And there was a guy named Jeff Cook that worked there, and he sang in Tommy Boland's band called Energy. And uh, he was kind of our guru about what we should buy and what we shouldn't buy. He, he would say, no, you don't want to buy that record. You want to buy this one. And he had, handed me uh, Junior Wells' first album, the one with Buddy Guy. Yeah, uh, uh, that record. You know, but uh, that was a big record, you know, for me to have when I'm 14 years old. But uh, they, we bought the import Electric Ladyland with the Nega Girls on the outside. Oh. You know, it, it was different, you know, different kind of sleeve and different. It was the English version. It came out uh, like a week before the American version. So we had that version first. So Electric Ladyland, Buddy Guy and Junior Wells would be number three. Well, I wouldn't. I don't know if I was going to put Buddy Guys and Junior Wells on there, but it certainly was influential. Um, gosh, you know, I think of the, all the incredible records I've listened to in my life. It's hard for me to really... Um, uh, that's rough, man. Yeah. I don't know. That's a, I have to think about this one for a minute. I guess it would change every hour of every oh, day. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, that's why I said I qualified. This is just for right now, your knee-jerk reaction. This would take a year to figure out otherwise. Yeah, right. Um, well, uh, one that really got me when I was a kid, and I always listen to it still to this day, was uh, it was a Jimmy Smith record um, that had, I'm not sure what the name of their album was. I think it was the Oregon Grinder Swing. That was the first cut on the album, on the Jimmy Smith record. Yeah, obviously he was With a very that. big influence on you. Yeah, Kenny Burrell on guitar. I could. That oh. was the first guitar solo that I could hum. I mean, that that solo was in my head before I ever picked up a guitar, before I even knew how to play a guitar. I, I, could, I could sing Kenny Burrell's solo, his opening notes and his solo, um, on that song, on, on Jimmy Smith's Oregon Grinder Swing, you know. 
And I always loved to listen to that album. It was the first Jimmy Smith album that my dad had, and I listened to it over and over and over. And that was one of those records that I don't know why I liked it so much. I just liked it, you know. It had all the elements of everything that I thought sounded good. Sometimes it's nostalgia of a, an era that you know, <clears throat> yeah. draws you yeah, to something. I, I mean, when the first time I heard that guy was on KDKO Soul Radio in Denver, and that guy would play a lot of James Brown. Dr. Daddy O was the DJ. And Dude, your memory play. is like impeccable. Well, we used to, Dr. Daddy O's, uh, the KDKO station was right over the Woodlawn Theater where I used to go see all the movies, you know. Yeah. And uh, that's where my, I, I would go to the matinees there when I was a little kid on Saturday afternoons, you know, 25 cent, you know. Yeah. Watch a you know, Elvis movie or whatever, you know. And uh, uh, when uh, then when I started listening to KDKO, we realized the station was right up on top of the movie theater, like the side uh, door. Yeah. And we walk up the steps, and you could watch Doctor Daddy O DJing. He, had, he Doctor Daddy O drove a uh, a purple Cadillac with his name on the license written, plate. R- no, r- r- painted in cursive on the side in pink. <laughs> <laughs> He's Doctor Daddy O. Doctor Daddy O. And he would he would rap over the top of Jimmy Smith records. You know, like you know Jimmy Smith records. Would he he play those things, and he say, "Ah, I hate you, Jimmy." Uh, yeah, oh yeah, I get it. Uh, you know, he'd say <laughs> stuff like that, you know, like, mm-hmm. you know, and whatever, you know, he would fade his voice in over the top, you know, and, and I was like, oh, wow, what is this Jimmy Smith stuff? And my dad had one of those records, I started listening to it, and I was like, oh, God, this is just too cool. It just sounded like the coolest stuff in the world, you know. And Jimmy was an animal, you know. He was just, he was such a scrapper, you know, so such a competitive player, you know. Just like an athlete, you know, he was, he just, he was, you know, it turns out he, I was right, you know, he was really a, he was that kind of person, you know, just a real, you know, aggressive, visceral kind of player. Hmm. And, um, apparently he was not the world's nicest guy. Oh, but, really? Uh, I, 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 I kind of glean that from people that I've known that were around him when he played, but, you know, I'm sure he, I'm sure he was, uh, <laughs> I have this one album of his where <laughs> at the end of the record, it's like a 70s record, early 70s record. At the end of the record, it's just him talking. And he said, yeah, you know, we, we came in and we recorded this album today. And, uh, you know, we got so-and-so on here. But it's just a real cat's play and real music, man. This ain't no bullshit, you know. This is like the real thing, you know. And it's like, <laughs> it's so cool what he says, you know. It's like the last cut on the album is him talking about his own record that you just listened to and I was like this is really great you know what a way to end a record of him kind of basically putting down everybody else in the industry talking about <laughs> how we just we came in here and did this one day and it's like this is the way it's supposed to be done because we're the real cats who actually know how to really play that's kind of you know, cool and, man. and you know and that's true I mean they really were the cats and they really could play you know and it's, it's some bad stuff but I, I I discovered that record later on and I and, I played it over and over that track, just laughing, you know, just thinking, this is great, you know, what a thing to do. So, you know, that's that's hubris right there. Yeah, know, for sure, man. To the max. But I love it. I think it's so cool. So uh-huh. that was one of those records, you know. I can't remember the name of that record, though. I think it might have been the Oregon Grinder Swing, but it, that's the first cut on the album at any rate. It's one of those, uh, I think... Wasn't he on the Verve label? Verve was the label he was on. I'm Take pretty a look. sure. Sounds like to me. What, what would be the number three, man? Mm, well, <clears throat> I mean, I imagine, you know, I had it all, you know, I bought every, you know, I, I, it's kind of a cliche, you know, um, uh, you know, I bought every Beatles and Rolling Stones and Birds album the day they came out. But I would have to say that Revolver record was probably the one that did the most damage. You know, man, do you know to my, um, to my little brain? You know, because you know, I ha- I didn't have the English version. I had the American version, which was you know stripped down, didn't have all the songs on it. But you know, I had the singles anyway. So most of what everything that was on the actual version was on that record except with the exception of uh, uh, Dr. Robert wasn't on there that didn't come out until the, they were 
put out a capo put out uh, yesterday and today, which was a collection of stuff that didn't wasn't on all, all the records. And um, and your bird can sing was not on the American version, but nonetheless, what was on the American version was did a lot of damage. You know, it's like whoa, what just happened? You know, this isn't like what you know. Rubber Soul was kind of they opened the door, they kicked the door open from being just a pop band to mm-hmm. you know a little teenage boy band to being something more than that and then revolver was like okay you know they weren't just smoking weed they were taking lsd too you know and Mm -hmm. and you can tell man it's like wow this is really cool this is like a whole different ball game here every song's different and it's like it's just a whole new world now you know and we kind of knew like when the single uh, "Rain" and "Paperback Writer" that was a that was a single that came out and hit the airways and became a big hit, you know. But "Paperback Writer" great song was the A side and "Rain" was the B side. You knew right then, suddenly that all rules have been changed, and that you know all the poor little bands sitting around, you know, probably scratching their heads, going, "What are we going to do? <laughs> <You know? laughs> like, how are we going to deal with this?" Yeah. You know? yeah. Because suddenly the world went from black and white to Technicolor, you know. It's like, this is not your regular old teenage pop music anymore. You know, this is like something else altogether, you know. And you just knew it, and, you know. And then they just started hitting you with every new release after that, you know. It's like, then came Revolver. And then came the next single for the next album was uh, uh, Strawberry Fields Forever and Penny Lane. And you knew that something was up there. And then they put out Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. So that little patch of music right there, you know, starting with Paperback Rider and Rain to, to Revolver to Strawberry Fields to Rubber Soul. That was, I mean, to, uh, to Sgt. Pepper's. That was a, like a big light, you know, that was like light year jump in music, you know, the way people yeah. listen to music, you know. You know, it sounds like a cliche now when you talk about it, but you, if you were living it right then... No, it's dramatic. It, it was really um, an epic deal. You know, it was like, this is not... You know, they really did a lot more to change popular music than they get credit for and some by some modern people. And you know, I've heard people, like, put them down now and say, oh, yeah, 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 yeah the fact that we was it. Which I can understand from a young person's perspective, but... If you were there at that time, nothing like that had ever changed so many people at one time, like yeah. those little pieces of wax did, you know? Like that's, you know, that's, we're talking about two singles and two albums that completely turned popular music and, and the world, and just like the world from, if you look at the world in 1966 and look at it in 1968, that's like that's a pretty big quantum leap in music styles. Yeah. You know? <coughs> and it, they were sort of at the forefront of it for whatever reason, you know. Do, do you know a player in uh, Muscle Shoals named Kelvin Holly? You know Kelvin? Uh-uh. Uh, I just interviewed him yesterday. He, he Revolver was like his one of his top three too for the same exact reason. Yeah, same, but, same age as you are, pretty much. Yeah, you know, you couldn't. Yeah. I mean, it was a difficult thing to uh, ignore. You know? mm. And if by the you way, had that, any kind of ears at all, you know, you were like, "Whoa!" <laughs> organ Grinder else. Swing was on Verb. I just looked it up. Okay, and yeah, it was the name yeah. of the album, Organ Grinder Swing. That was the name of the album. Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, that was for oh, leading cut, lead yeah. off cut. Nineteen sixty-five. I can still hum Kenny Burrell's solo, and I could do that before I could play guitar. So, well, I got it up here. I'm going to listen to it after. After uh, it's you know it's, it's you know t- Kenny Burrell was the restrained economical player you know he wasn't like west montgomery or anything but he, he was cool you know he was very cool um best childhood memory uh well i i again it's a cliche but you know when the beatles played the first night on ed sullivan was that's something that would like changed everybody but when i was 10 when that happened so that was that was a big deal man mm-hmm I went from being just another kid to to like my mission in life was to get a, my hands on a guitar right there that moment and, <laughs> you know, that was it you know and it was like I, I can't erase that that the feeling of watching you know uh, everybody was gathered around the TV and, and how that affected everybody in the room 
you know, my grandparents, my mom and my dad, my uncle and my aunt, my cousins and me and my sister, we were all sitting there watching that thing and it, it, and it messed everybody up, you know. Nobody, you know, nobody was able to completely come to terms with it because, you know, you know the older folks didn't really care for what they were seeing and they knew there was trouble up. You know, this is going to be like, this, this is like, it, it, it introduced so many elements into their poor little world, and they could tell that there was gonna, this wasn't going to go away. And they, but, and they all said it would, but they knew it wasn't. <laughs> you know, and we, and we kids knew that it wasn't going to go away. You know, they all, they were going to be over in, a, in you know, six months from now. Nobody ever heard of the Beatles, and we were like, yes. Yeah, and the kids thing, knew this was know? just the beginning. Well, yeah, you just knew. It was like, this is like, this is just like unbelievable. You know, it's like, this, there was something about them that was just something you knew that that wasn't going to go away. Hmm. And it, was, and it wasn't going to, that, that this, this wasn't all they had to offer. You know, there was like some other thing at work there. You know, they had, there was too much uh, behind them intellectually, you know. They, they were, uh, there was a lot behind the curtain there when at, when you looked at, at their faces and when they looked at the camera, you could tell, you know, that they weren't just your typical dumbass pop stars, you know. Happiest moment or time in your life? <coughs> mm. Well, generally, that's when, uh, if, if I'm, usually that's if I'm having a good day playing something on the guitar where I'm working on something new and, and I finally make a breakthrough and I get it all together and you know maybe it's a new song or a new uh, way of negotiating something you know yeah that happens frequently where you know where that's that's pretty much it for me I'm, I'm kind of kind of narrow-minded I guess in my scope of being a human being and uh, uh, that's I always it still goes back down to that for me, you know. I really enjoy what I do, and so I'm, I'm glad that I have something like yeah. that. You know, I, I, you know, I, you know, like, certainly, you know, like maybe um, my wife and kids might think I'm a little bit too uh, narrow-minded. You know, like not a very well-developed person, but <laughs> <clears throat> but you know, I often feel sorry for people that don't have something like what I have. You know? Yeah. Uh, like my hobby is what I do for a living. Yeah. You know? And people ask, well, what do you do for a hobby? I said, well, I, I look at guitars on the internet or I, <laughs> or I, or, or I Google, uh, how to play something by yeah. somebody, you know, I try and figure out how they did something, you know, on the guitar or, you know, but if it's, if it's not looking at a vintage guitar, it's, it's trying to figure out how to play something on a guitar, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. No, I told, No, I don't I don't I think it's whatever you you like, man. I don't Yeah, I'm just so I'm so lucky That's what to makes be, the world go round, you know. You know, and, and, you know if I lost my ability to play today, I would probably go into dealing guitars or, you know, or something, you know. Something related to music. Yeah. Guitar. You know, yeah. Like, yeah. Or I'd well, manage another guitar player or something. You know, who knows? But yeah. I I'm never, you know, I'm just totally immersed in what I do happily. You know, yeah. It's my hobby. Most important person. My, sorry. What's that? So most important person in your life. Oh boy. Well, I better say my wife. <laughs> <That's what laughs> <you do>. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> I think so, Kenny. Yeah. Uh, let's start with her. Uh, she's pretty uh, influential. She's a musical genius. So um, she she has a, her own musical life completely separate from mine. You know. Is that she's amazing? Is that good that you can both kind of come back and talk about you know at the end of the day or the end of the week whatever you're and you both understand you know it's not well, like you know I, you're an investment banker and she's a musician or vice versa that you like have no clue as much as music brought us together and all that you know it's not really that big a part of our relationship mm. other than that's what we both do for a living so I guess that kind of figures in but <clears throat> you know I've learned to you know be her collaborator just by you know, trial and error, really, of helping her out, you know. I finally feel like I can produce her well, you know. Hmm. Yeah, and, um, she and listens to you? That. What? Does she listen to you when you're in a production mode? Mm, sometimes. Yeah. I think, you know, I think I've, uh, 
you know, I finally, you know, rolled up my sleeves and really went to, to work this last two years trying to get her on to be her producer, you know, yeah. for, for real. And uh, it worked out really well. And I think she's happy with most of what I've done. But she's very opinionated and we butt heads, you know. Yeah. Uh, but uh, she knows what she's doing and she's a very uh, smart person. I just brought a, I was able to sit on the other side of the glass and police what the other players were doing and be the bad cop. And, you know, yeah. And we, which has uh, worked out really well, you know. And, um, I, you know, I had to, you know, sometimes you a little intimidated by the players, but you've got to go and you've got to be, you know, the agent of the song and go in there and, hmm. and say, hold it. This isn't, this isn't right. You've got to play it differently. You know, yeah. This isn't, the, you're not playing the song the way the, song, the singer is. You, know, you got to play this instead, you know, and you know, here in this section, I want you to do this and this section, I want you to do that. You give examples, and, you know, try and jar them out of whatever they're, you know, try and, get them to think about it differently and all that stuff you know it's interesting you said that um i would have bet the same way you were intimidated by the players i would bet they were intimidated by you well we're friends and so you know the thing is to not be intimidated and just try and get the best out of everybody mm. get them really you know have a good time and playing something that really moves you know get some and you know you, you pretty much know when you get a good take when Everybody, uh, you can say, come on in, and they can listen and say, yeah, okay, that, we got that one, you know. Because, mm. you know, it's a group thing, you know, you sure. got to get a... <coughs> we're, we're, we're a performance-oriented, um, my, my method is, and, and I tend not to use a click track, and I tend to go for basic tracks where everybody's playing and moving to the song. Live together. Yeah, live with the dynamics yeah. and... You know, that's the big thing to get a feel and a rush and a dynamic thing where there's, it's a performance and it conveys emotion. Emotion is very important. You know? Oh, it's everything, man. Yeah, that's the hardest thing to capture you know, this day and age because everybody, everybody's in Nashville, especially, is so used to, you know, it's formula. A very, yeah, it's a very sort of sedate process and it's very picked apart and lifeless in many ways it sounds kind of <laughs> cartoony and, and and not in a good way you know hmm. <coughs> Do you have any uh, non-musical superpowers nope i can't think of any um anything that you're trying to improve on kenny yeah yeah my yeah, my guitar playing constantly, trying desperately to, um, you know, I've got, I've got a whole list of things I try to work on every day, you know, and uh, try to find as much time to do that as possible, you know, force yourself to do it. So you have specific things uh, like either licks or... Yeah, I've got licks. Yeah. I have uh, uh, concepts that I'm trying to employ, you know, uh, techniques, uh, and, and these are written, these are all written out? No. no okay, a lot of it's just in my head. Just that, in your head, you know, okay. But I have things that I'm you know, working on right now. There's a, you know, there's, uh, I have a trio that I work with in, in, uh, in some clubs in Nashville, just, just you know, like in, informal things where, we, where I try out some of my new stuff. And, and that's always, uh, it forces me to have to outline everything on the guitar, you know, just with a bass player and a drummer. And um, when it comes to polychord types of situations and soloing over, over um, sort of advanced changes, I have to figure out how to outline, even in the course of soloing, how to keep the harmony uh, presented to the listener so they know what's going on, you know. Mm. And that requires a lot of thought and and trial and error and developing, you know, ways, improvising, but with a set of harmonic rules that you have to sort of apply at the same time, you know. So it's a real challenge. Some of my new stuff that I've been working on is it's very uh, difficult to do that on. But it's fun to try, you know. Yeah, yeah. It can be done. It's just, it's, I have to think way, 
with a whole new set of uh, parameters, you know. Will you just lay down track, lay down the rhythm on a looper, and then work through it like there? Like, how do you typically? Mostly do? that. Now that doesn't work so well because then I can't tell if I'm doing it or not, you know. So I just try and just try and outline line it just with one guitar, just sitting around, you know, playing, you know, hmm. <coughs> trying to convey the, the the chord changes and the and the solo extensions all at once, you know, okay. just by the my note selection. Because that's really what you want, you know. You want the, you want it all to take the listener on a journey, you know, and and you want them to hear the the harmony that you're that that is underneath everything, you know. So that's Man, a, it's that's a, great it's to hear. Good, it's been a good exercise for me to do that. There's a guy that influenced me a lot lately uh, in, that I met in Nashville. Who uh, his name is Jim Oblon? O-B-L-O-N. Oh yeah, Jim. Yeah, he's the guy who turned us on to each other. Yeah, Jim is uh, amazing, yeah. man. He he's yeah, amazing. Yeah, he's uh, he really opened up my ears and uh, got me to think about things differently. Mm. And so he's been an influence on me, whether he likes to admit it or not. You know, he's definitely. And I don't play anything like him whatsoever. No, you know, my music doesn't sound anything like his. But he's been a huge influence on me. Just sitting around watching him play and listening to what he's doing, I'm like, oh yeah, okay. He's he's doing things that nobody else is doing, and I like what it is because yeah. it sounds good. It has a, it, you know. He's a real artist. Jim's a real artist. Definitely. He's he's, he's making a, a, a statement when he plays that that goes beyond words, you know. And uh, I really dig that. There's a lot of emotion in what he plays, and there's. He's he's going places where no one else goes, yeah. you know. And it's like it's so brilliant the way he's he's gone about it, and so incredibly artistic. I really have a lot of respect for Jim. He was like, yeah. that's a, you know, and he's he's kind of made me think about things in a different way. And like in the last four years, I've because of hearing him, I've forced myself to do things that I never would have done before, you know. That's really cool. He's also a very yeah. soulful person. Man. <coughs> oh yeah, very good guy. Yeah, we've uh, sat up and drank wine and stayed up late talking about who knows what. You know. Yeah, he's a good cat, yeah. real good dude. Yeah, and we, you know, he's he really got me to thinking about things in a in a fresh way. You know, without really, I'm not really doing what he does, but it it really, uh, you know, he's like been a really big influence on me. Well, my, that's probably the biggest influence I've had lately it would be that guy. That's know? awesome. And for anybody yeah. listening, I interviewed Jim a few episodes ago, so just uh, look him up. It's Jim Oblon, O-B-L-O-N. Go to the website. Yeah, Everyone knows guitar. He's a monster, com. man. He sure he's is. A, I, I, I remember a couple of times, I, he used to play over at this place called the Foo Bar, and he'd get maybe 20 people in to watch him, you know. And there was a, it was a hipster bar, and a lot of uh, young people would go in there to drink you know late the late night crowd mm. if they'd start showing up about the time he was nearing the end of his set you know and they'd be hanging out at the bars you know like there'd be like a, a bunch of like 22 year old 23 year old girls hanging at the bar drinking you know and and they're all hipster chicks you know and on more than one occasion I remember they would have his, their backs to him and he'd be up on the stage not playing terribly loud you know this guitar bass and drums He's up there, and he, and he would do something on the guitar, and they would turn around and look at the stage like, what just happened? You know? And they weren't there to see him, but yeah. but he, he they would turn around because they knew something just happened. Right, right. <laughs> It was so cool to watch. It was like, wow, he got these people to turn around and look and like, like just sort of like their minds were blown, but they didn't know why. Yeah, yeah. You know? Because he, because of these notes that he played, you know, it's like that's a that's pretty cool, you know. That his note selection caused them to their heads to jerk around and look at him like, what in the world did it just happen? Yeah, what very smart that? guy. Yeah, I thought that's pretty extraordinary because you know they're in no way interested in this guy or his music, <laughs> but but yet he caused them to completely interrupt what their thought process was and look at him you know it's, i think it's it's cool that your 
working on the same things even at your high level that like a guy like myself who's you know a big you know a relative beginner is working on and you're just working on it at a higher level you know well anytime you learn something new you know it's like you've never played the instrument before it's like you yeah. can hardly play anything but if you keep hammering away at it, you know, certainly it comes along and then all of a sudden one day you, you can do it. But you got, you know, like teaching yourself new things on the guitar and, and music structure things, you know, sometimes it takes forever. Hmm. And you just got to keep hammering away at it. And, and you know, recently I've had a few small little successes that, you know, have been really encouraging for me because I'm like, my hard work paid off. <laughs> yes. You know, I stuck with it and I persevered and all of a sudden I got a little bit better at doing this thing and I can do it now, you know, and that's really, you know, even at my age, it's like, it's a big thing and it makes you feel better. You know, it's like, yeah. wow, I did this, you know, I, I, I stuck with it and I kept on it. And instead of playing the same old shit, I decided I wasn't going to do that. And I was going to really, you know, I'm doing what I really want to do here, you know, and, and, it, and, you know, it takes a lot of work to do something like that. Hell yeah. And it's so good to hear you saying this because I feel the same way when I do something in my, my little world, my little guitar world. So it's it's um, really cool to hear that. Yeah, I mean, I think everybody does. I don't think, you know, I don't think you ever get to the point where suddenly everything's easy. You know, I know, I mean, I know this one kid who plays fiddle that's probably the most scary musician on the planet. And... Uh, He's the only guy I know that maybe things are easy for him. But he's doing things that are so outrageous uh, conceptually and theoretically. It's just mind-boggling. It's like so far away from anything else I've ever heard. And, it, and, it's, so, and it's so easy that it sounds great, you know. For him, it just sounds, he just makes it sound like pure fun. But, mm. but when you examine what he's doing conceptually and technically, it's like, incredibly dense you know it's like oh my god but for him it's a block in the park but he's an, an exception to the rule i think for yeah. everybody else you got to work hard you know i know he has but it just doesn't sound like he did man you know what's interesting we're at, we're at the end of the interview and you're physically at the same location we started at the beginning so this all yeah, so timing I, I had, this is all worked out, man. The universe is supporting to, this I whole had, flow. I had to go man. back to my. I had to go back to my. Uh, <laughs> to my uh, charger here. Hey, um, I want to tell people first of all, thank you very much for your time, man. I really appreciate it. Oh, thanks for having me. You're welcome, and I want to tell people where they can find you. First of all, um, Kenny tours with Marty Stewart, and he's been with Marty seventeen years. Uh, support these guys when they're coming out on tour. They get they're in the middle of a tour now, and it's going to be going on for a few more months over the throughout the whole summer at least. Uh, we we never really quit. We we uh, we play every year about a hundred shows a year, and we awesome. Just, you know, every year, you know, we to contend. It's a we we don't really take you know. It's being in Nashville and centrally located. We normally just go out Thursday, Friday, Saturday, that kind of thing. You know. You coming down but, here? Um, where are you located? Tampa. We, I think we might be doing some Stapleton dates down there. If we get anywhere close to you, um, you got to come to our show. Yeah, I'd love it, man. I would love get it. your passes, and you got to come see us. I just want to see you play. I've seen you play only on YouTube videos. I want to watch your magic in person, man. Well, our 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 show is really good. Everybody that comes to the Marty Stewart show, every single person I've ever, that has ever come that I knew. They all said the same thing, and that's like I wasn't expecting anything like that. As they all say the same thing, every person. And I'm like, what were you expecting? They're like, I don't know, but I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm like just everybody's... hoping if I get near you guys, I'll have hair that's remotely like both of you guys. That would be a big plus for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let me tell you where you could find um, – uh, uh, Kenny and Marty go to martystuart.net it's m-a-r-t-y-s-t-u-a-r-t dot net I would uh, their last record was called Way Out West it's a great album um, they're currently doing 38 shows supporting Chris Stapleton so that'll be a hell of a good show and Kenny's got song credits writing songs and co-writing on a lot of the, the uh, Way Out West album um, 
and check out Kenny online for sure. It's Kenny Vaughn, V A U G H N. Are you on like Instagram and and social media? I am on in- Instagram and Facebook. Yes. Okay, just Kenny Vaughn. Yep. Okay, it's V A U G H N. Um, also, let's talk about your wife, Carmela Ramsey, because she's the hell of a good singer. Um, really haunting, very melodic voice, and I know you're producing her. You mentioned a couple of times. Yeah. Yeah, hopefully we'll have something available in the next uh, 12 months, you know, to where somebody put it out and listen to it, you know. She has a couple of things you can find on Instagram and Facebook. She's a great singer, and uh, yeah, she she writes good. all her own songs, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, Boy, does she ever. Yeah. And uh, congratulations. You said you've been together like 24 years, you said? 23 years? Well, yeah, about 24. Five, 23 years of marriage. Yeah. Awesome, man. Congratulations. That's not easy. I think it's a big accomplishment. It's not easy. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's for damn sure. Um, hey, man. <coughs> any final words of wisdom? Bless you. Oh, keep playing the guitar. That's all. There you go. Don't stop. Don't stop. It's the, it's the best thing to do. It is. Everyone loves guitar. That's right, man. Especially uh, you and me. Hell yeah. Um, hey man thank you again seriously for your time I really appreciate it thank cool. you oh that was great a lot of fun talking to you thank you for having me likewise everybody thank you so much for listening I hope you enjoyed this interview as much as I did thanks again to Kenny Vaughn for spending time with us please go out and support Kenny and uh, Marty Stewart on their tour uh, he's just a tremendous guitarist and go to everyonelovesguitar.com sign up to get on our newsletter list get some future episodes ahead of time and uh, early product announcements and this last part is important remember that happiness is a choice so choose wisely be nice there you go there you go right bro go play your guitar and have fun till next time peace and love everybody I'm out we hope you enjoyed this show if you did subscribe to the everyone loves guitar podcast and you can do this online at everyonelovesguitar.com or on itunes and if you like the show please leave us a five-star positive review the more five-star reviews we get the higher our show ranks and higher rankings mean we get to continue speaking with cool interesting guests on our show we'll see you on the next episode and until then keep playing your guitar and have fun making music Thank you.